Okay, so we're on part two of our biodiversity. And in this part, we're going to talk about biodiversity as a result of evolution. So students will describe the tools available to researchers for learning the evolutionary history of life in order to briefly describe the theory of evolution, being sure to include the roles played by variation within the gene pool and natural selection, extinction, speciation, and adaptive radiation. So um, some new vocabulary here, right? Speciation, adaptive radiation. So we'll continue on. A lot of this is going to be a review from your evolution chapter, but um, recognize a billion years of chemical change to form the first cells followed by 3.7 billion years of biological change. So this is the, how they're saying the formation of Earth's early crust and atmosphere and how that led to where we currently are, right? A variety of multi multicultural organisms that formed first in the seas and then moved their way onto land. So one thing I want to preface this by saying at no way, shape, or form am I trying to negate what you learn at home or through church or whatever, but this is um, evolution as scientists see it. And because we're scientists in this class, we learn it and we understand what their um, evidences are for it. So biological evolution, um, it's led to a variety of species we find on Earth today. So if we look at one billion years ago, evolution and expansion of life started about 7,800 million years ago with some of these smaller single cellular organisms that you find in the sea. Um, there are some bacteria here, right, and here. Then you have jellyfish who have been around for a very, very long time. And at the aquarium, for those of you that were paying attention, there was a, um, or may have seen it, there was a display on the um, jellyfish about how it's like outlived everything, right? Been there forever and it still is existence here today. So about 65 million years ago is when they say the modern human um, appeared about two seconds before midnight. You know, who knows what those times really are, but this is what they're saying. So how do we know organisms lived in the past? So we have fossils, chemical analysis of other things that we found, cores drilled out of bur buried ice. So if you know when you have um, a cube of ice, right, you notice that inside that cube of ice, oftentimes there are these little holes, right, little spaces in there. And those, in essence, are air pockets. And if you drill a hole into ice, you can get into those air pockets. And in those air pockets, it's going to give us the um, atmosphere of the time of that ice thing right um when that ice was packed down so you can sort of say where it is in terms of um how far below the earth but then also where it is in terms uh what kind of atmosphere was there so that's what they mean by that and then dna analysis right so you find these fossils you find old bones you find um different things and you do a dna analysis and you can use the dna analysis to compare it to current um, species, especially a current species that looks similar that is found in the same area where those fossils or those bones may have been found. So um, evolution by natural selection involves the change in the population's genetic makeup through successive generations. So recognizing that evolution is not instant. Right? Instead, it is this uh, slowly occurring process that happens after generation to generation to generation. So you have genetic variability that occurs through mutations, changes. So recognizing that mutations aren't always bad. Sometimes a mutation changes something for the better. Random changes in structure. So this is what a mutation is, right? So this is the definition. A natural selection acts on individuals, but evolution occurs in populations, right? So individuals are naturally selected um, to survive. But as evolution occurs, you need several individuals to survive and then to mate to make new generations with the good stuff, right? The good traits that are naturally selected for survival. And that happens in populations. So, so evolution has to occur in populations, not in individuals. 
So there are three conditions necessary for biological evolution. First, genetic variability. The trait must exist in a population. So humans, the trait for flying doesn't exist. So we won't ever be able to evolve to fly, right? Traits or grow wings, right? Maybe to fly, right? But to actually grow wings, we won't be able to have that trait. Second, the traits must be heritable. It must be a trait that can be passed down from generation to generation because otherwise when the organisms with the good stuff mate and make babies with the good stuff, the good stuff has to be able to be passed down to them. Um, next, the trait must lead to differential uh, reproduction. It must enable individuals with the trait to leave more offspring than other members in the population. And this is very similar to an invasive species, right? The new species has to be able to survive and thrive better than what's there, right, in order to be able to survive. So an adaptive trait, it's just a vocabulary. You can read that for yourself. So coevolution, co biological arms race. So these are just, you know, important vocabulary, right? Coevolution, interacting species engage in back and forth genetic contests. Um, so it's like a predator prey. If something, um, if I'm a burrowing animal, or don't burrow, but I have long nails and something's trying to get me and I dig, 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 I can get to the bottom or get away from it, right? And hide. So then I'm going to survive, but the organism won't be able to catch me unless there is another predator species that has the ability to dig that can get me right or burrow or stick his nose down right maybe one has a longer nose that can come get me things like that that's the idea of coevolution new species can arise through hybridization occurs when individuals of two distinct species crossbreed to produce fertile offspring so not like a liger right so not a liger but more like dogs and cats like how you get a pikachu and a poodle whatever right <laughs> all those things dolls and cats um and then there are some species mostly microorganisms that can exchange genes without sexual reproduction so horizontal gene transfer um when species upon feed upon another infects or come close to contact you can get a little bit right every time um you know a parasite or something may feed on something else it may it has the ability to leave something behind so that's what it is so a population's ability to adapt to new environmental conditions through natural selection is limited by its gene pool and how fast it can reproduce. So humans have a relatively slow generation time, right? It takes decades, right? Ten or so years before someone can have a new baby again, before they're able to give birth. An output of young versus some other species, right? We have one, two at a time naturally, maybe three. So this is a reminder, right? We talked about this earlier in the year, a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. So your fundamental niche is the full potential, right? So everyone has fundamentally can get an A in this class, right? But the realization is that there are few that do, right? Um, it's what actually happens based on competition, based on predator-prey relationships, things like that. So broad and narrow niches, we talked about this again, I mean before too. So this whole idea between by generalist species and specialist species, so we talked about this. Generalist species can tolerate a wide range of conditions. They tend to be um, R specialists, but not necessarily. Um, but they can tolerate a lot of, uh, a large range of conditions, right? So if I can live in here, then if something happens that forces me to live out here, then I'm going to be able to survive. As opposed to if I'm here and it pushes me out so far, then I'm not going to survive, right? I'm going to die. Those are crosses over eyes, signaling death. <laughs> and specialist species is just the opposite. So cockroaches. There's a spotlight on cockroaches, and cockroaches are nasty, right? This is a really nasty picture to watch. But if you read it, it really gives a lot of um, insight into cockroaches and their ability to survive, right? How they're called these ultimate survivors. Um, and these are the reasons why. Specialized feeding niches, so you can have resource partitioning. And so, in essence, they're splitting up the resource so to reduce competition. And it allows all these birds to be able to live in the same place, nice and happy, 
without having major competition. And so one bird has long legs to go into the water, one flies to get its fish, one ducks down to get the food off the wire, one digs, right, has a long beak and can dig down and get it, right, shorter beak, things like that. It's called resource partitioning. Next we have evolutionary divergence. So each species has a beak specialized to take advantage of certain types of food. So we can imagine that there's some type of finch, an unknown ancestor that we don't quite know about. But now we currently have several different types of finches, right? Ones that eat fruit and seeds, and you can see that their beaks are shorter and stronger and thicker, right? And then you have insect and nectar eaters. Their, their beaks are longer to get into, right? Quite, right? This is probably in Hawaii, or maybe they all are. I know the honey creeper is. Maybe they're all in Hawaii. It looks like it. Um, and so this one eats the fruit and, you know, the nectar of a plant. So it can go in without really having to do much anything. So their beaks are softer, pointier, so that they can get through to the, to the fruit, through the flesh into the fruit. And so this is another idea that they all came from this common ancestor and based on where they live, right, so they're based on their habitat um, and their food sources or food availability, they um, develop different types of beaks or feeding methods. So speciation, so vocabulary word. New species can arise when a member of a population becomes isolated over a long period of time. So they say that there was an early fox population that lived, you know, kind of in this area, the border of Canada and the United States. Some went north, some went south, and those that went north had to adapt to the cold weather. They had to get, you know, the white fur to blend in, short ears short legs um, and then the gray fox adapted to heat so they have lighter fur um, longer ears legs noses etc and so this is the idea of speciation when they separated so there was one ancestor right this is the one ancestor and when those ancestors said I'm going this way well I'm gonna go this way they they adapted it to um, to fit and match their popula uh, their habitat. And so this is the idea of speciation. So um, to talk about extinction, it occurs when the population cannot adapt to changing environmental conditions. This is um, common in endemic species, right? And most endemic species are found in only one area because they're only they can only live in that area, right? So they are um, specialists, right? They can only live in that area. They only the food they eat only exists in that area, and so if they are brought from that area or that area becomes inhabitable for them, then they um, can become extinct. Um, here is, you know, figure 12, 412 in your textbook. It just talks about uh, the, the different time frames when organisms or different types of organisms existed, right? So here we are today in the quaternary period, okay? Um, and down here we had several mass. So these are, when we talked about before, the one, two, three, four, five mass extinctions, right, um, that we mentioned earlier in the beginning of the chapter when we read about the pigeon pilot, the pigeon, passenger pigeons, um, and the current extinction caused by, so they're saying that there could be another mass extinction caused by human activities, right, because we are killing a whole lot of stuff based on our activities. So the effects of human on biodiversity, so this is just proof to show that we are. Um, when when the humans, you know, came to be, right, um, we saw a decline in or a leveling off of populations. Okay, so just to see both terrestrial and marine organisms showing that we are affecting it somehow.
So the next part we'll talk about is genetic engineering and the role that genetic engineering plays in evolution or the future of evolution and how that can affect, can affect biodiversity. And I'm going to stop it there and do a new video so that we don't run out of time.